All right, welcome back scholars to a uh, video on intermolecular forces and um, specifically intermolecular forces for nonpolar molecules. And so I wanna remind you that what I said was probably the most important equation from all of physics, which is the equation down here at the bottom for the Coulombic force. And this is the attractive force or a repulsive force between two charged objects. And this exists for everything. And of course, if we've got ionic compounds, then the ions have a full permanent charge that's always there. If we have dipoles or polar molecules, those polar molecules only have a partial charge that is always there. And if we have nonpolar molecules, we still get partial charges but they're not permanent, they don't last. And in this Coulombic force equation or the uh, uh, force between two electrical charges, one of the important parts is the distance. Remember that the distance here is represented by R and this distance is squared and it's in the denominator. So what this means is that as we increase the distance between the two charges, the Coulombic force goes down. And if we decrease the distance, if we bring the charges closer together, the columbic force goes up. And we can actually relate this to how a flashlight looks on a wall when we're shining it. And if you have the spot of light on the wall, it covers a certain area when you're a certain distance away from the wall. Let's say you're pretty close. If you back up from the wall and keep holding the flashlight the same way, you're going to cover more area with the light but any one single spot on that wall where you're shining the light is gonna have a much less intense beam of light from the flashlight. This decrease in the intensity of light follows this relationship that we see here in the Columbic force equation. And that specific kind of a relationship where things decrease at a squared rate in the denominator is called the inverse square law. And so we see that here with the attraction between charges. The other important part of this equation, of course, is the charge. We've got the charge for two different um, charged objects or charged points or atoms or ions or molecules. And the product of those two charges gives us the columbic force. So if we imagine taking a full charge of, let's say, 2 plus and 2 minus, and we multiply those together, what do we get? 4 minus or negative 4. And that negative sign represents an attractive force. And that force is gonna be four times higher than the attractive force between two charges that are one plus and one minus. And of course the product between one plus and one minus would be one. And it would be negative one, so it's still attractive. If we think now about doing fractions of charge, and let's just say we've got a half times a half, and it's positive and negative. One half times one half is one fourth. Notice the product got smaller. If our partial charges are even smaller, like as in a tenth, and we do a tenth times a tenth, then that becomes one hundredth. So these forces for nonpolar molecules in particular are very, very, very weak. Um, and they don't last long, but they do have some be effect on the behavior of the molecules. And so for these London dispersion forces or just dispersion forces, we're looking at temporary dipoles. We're really looking at temporary fluctuations in the charge of the atom or the molecule. And these temporary fluctuations are caused by instantaneous or momentary uneven distributions of electrons. These give rise to these dispersion forces, and these dispersion forces are the intermolecular forces between nonpolar molecules, where one molecule has a temporary dipole, and the other could have an induced dipole, or it could also have its own temporary dipole that starts on its own. Connected in with this concept is the idea of polarizability, which is the relative ease with which we can shift the electron cloud in a molecule, ion, or atom. And this means the, uh, which, how easy it is, is it to distort the cloud? And if we can distort that cloud, then we can create a temporary dipole. And if we create a temporary dipole, 
then we're going to have dispersion forces between those neighboring molecules. And so here's two single atoms. And these could be like, let's say, neon gas molecules or atoms. Um, we could still call them molecules even though they're only a single atom. In this case, as those two atoms approach each other, what happens, and it doesn't really matter on which atom, but one of these atoms begins to generate a higher electron density, which means that side of the atom is a little bit more negative. Because that side's a little bit more negative, what is it gonna do to electrons in the cloud of the other atom? Well, it's also going to repel those electrons, and we see that side also becomes a little bit negative. But what happens to the side of the atom where the electrons were repelled? Hopefully you said that actually gets a little bit more positive. And so now we've got a positive and a negative charge on these two neighboring atoms. Of course, these charges are really only partial charges. They're not complete charges. And so their values for their charge would just be a fraction. So the force here is weak, but there is still a force of attraction here. These temporary dipoles, they are just created randomly. They could be more negative on one side of the atom just because the, of how the electron cloud shifts and where the electrons are themselves at any instant in time. Remember, the electrons are in constant motion. Now, if you have polar molecules, like as in the case with water, polar molecules have a permanent dipole. And because they have a permanent dipole, one side of that water molecule always has a partial negative. The other side always has a partial positive. And what's gonna happen to the electrons in this cloud on this oxygen molecule when the oxygen molecule gets close to the water? Hopefully you said those electrons will be repelled again by the negative charge on the oxygen in the water. And they are able to induce a dipole in the oxygen molecule. That induced dipole is attracted to the permanent dipole in the water. And then that's why oxygen is able to dissolve in water. And if oxygen could not dissolve in water, then we'd have no aquatic life. And if you think back to the unit on evolution and biology, we saw that we all came from some common ancestor and that common ancestor had to have lived in the oceans. So in the long run, if we didn't have these instantaneous or induced dipoles, there would probably be no life on earth. Now let's look at some more examples with this in terms of how the size and the number of electrons affects this. So if we go back and we think about polarizability, this is the ease with which the electron cloud can be shifted. The electron cloud will be shifted more easily for larger atoms, but notice that these larger atoms also have more electrons. And so we've got two things going on here at the same time. So more electrons, increases the strength of the dispersion forces, and the size, the larger something is, the stronger the dispersion force is. And so with the noble gases, we've got helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. As we go down the periodic table, notice that their boiling points are increasing. Well, what does that mean? What we're doing here is we're saying that the boiling point is a measure or the boiling point is proportional to the strengths of the intermolecular forces. And this is the intermolecular forces overall. So if there were more than this dispersion force going on, the boiling points would still increase. In this case of the noble gases, the only intermolecular force occurring is that of the dispersion forces. Notice the boiling points go up. That means the intermolecular forces are getting stronger. These atoms are being held more tightly together when there's a bunch of xenon atoms around or when there's a bunch of neon atoms around. We can see something similar going on with the halogens. 
Now, remember the halogens are all going to be diatomic molecules. And so for us to compare these, we really need to think about the um, number of electrons here. And so I'm going to put a little column here for the atomic number. And the atomic number for fluorine is 9. So if we have two fluorines together, that means that we have 18 electrons. So for fluorine, the gas, we have 18 electrons. How does the boiling point of fluorine compare to the boiling point of argon? It's pretty close. It's practically the same. So we see that for 18 electrons, we've got the same strength of dispersion forces again. All right, now how about chlorine? Chlorine has an atomic number of 17. If we have two chlorines together, that gives us a total of 34 electrons, a little less than the atomic number for krypton. But notice what happens to the boiling point for chlorine compared to the boiling point for krypton. This boiling point is like twice as high. Why is that? Well, this chlorine molecule is more spread out than the krypton atom is. And so this is really the size effect. We've still got about the same number of electrons, but this molecule is larger because the molecule is larger because it has more surface area, if you want to think about it that way. It has more or stronger dispersion forces, and it has a higher boiling point. We could keep going, and we could take a look at bromine. And bromine has an atomic number of 35. And when we have two bromines together, that's going to give us 70 electrons, which is going to fall on our chart over here with the noble gases between xenon and radon. But when we look at the boiling point for bromine, we notice that it's way higher even than the boiling point is for radon. Part of the reason why, again, is because the bromine molecule is much larger than even the radon atom is by itself. And it makes this hard then to compare the iodine and the astatine molecules to other things, but we still see this trend with the boiling points where the boiling points are increasing because the intermolecular forces are getting stronger. In this case, dispersion forces are getting stronger. So to review, what factors affect the strength of the dispersion forces or how often they occur? Well, the size of the atoms or the molecules affects this. The larger the atoms are or the molecules, the more polarizable they are. And this dispersion force, this strength of dispersion forces, increases as the molecules become more polarizable. The size of the atoms and molecules is also related to the number of electrons. So you can have more electrons in certain molecules, and the more electrons that you have, you tend to have larger molecules and larger atoms, but definitely the more electrons you have, the more polarizable it will be and the stronger the dispersion forces. So when we look at something like the alkanes, these are all one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbon alkanes. These molecules are getting larger, but they're also getting more electrons. So it's a little bit harder to separate those two effects but we can see that both effects, more electrons and larger molecules, are increasing the boiling point. And again, the boiling point is going up because the dispersion forces are getting stronger. So if we could figure out some way where we could separate these changes and look at molecules that had the same number of electrons but different shapes, this could help us figure out the importance of the shape. And we do, in fact, have constitutional isomers and if you remember, an isomer is when you can have more than one structure for the same molecular formula. If you think back, in fact, to the one class, we had C5H10, and you guys drew different isomers for that molecule. Depending on the block you were in, we had a double bond in that structure, and that double bond was in different positions. That molecule could have been branching. We also had some rings with that structure, with that molecule. And um, the key here is that when you have all those different isomers, th they're going to be different from each other because they're going to have different amounts of surface area. 
And the more surface area the molecule has, the more polarizable the molecule is, hence the stronger the possible interactions, the stronger the dispersion forces. And again, remember that the strength of these interactions, the strength of the dispersion forces is gonna to continue to influence the physical and chemical properties of these molecules. So if we take a look at the dispersion forces with a series of pentanes, and I'll give you the um, common names for these pentanes. The pentane that is five carbons all attached in one chain, one row, is normal pentane or N-pentane. The middle molecule here where there's a little branch at the end where there's four carbons attached in a row and that one carbon, the fifth carbon, is attached to one of those middle ones. This is called secondary pentane or sec pentane. S-E-C dash pentane is the abbreviation. And the final one, the common name where it gives us a plus sign where there's one carbon in the middle attached to four other different carbons. This is called isopentane. And the names that are here on the slide are the actual IUPAC or the um, professional names. So there's pentane, 2-methylbutane, and 2-2-dimethylpropane. Notice as you look at these molecules from left to right, the long chain at the beginning with pentane, that long chain is getting shorter, the amount of the surface area is going down, and I'll draw a picture when we do this in the uh, online Zoom class to help you see this with area and perimeter, but the surface area is decreasing as the amount of branching is increasing. So the more um, branching points there are, the less surface area there will be. The less surface area there will be, the weaker the dispersion forces. And the proof of this is in the boiling points. When you look at the boiling point for pentane, it's 309 Kelvin. This is just above room temperature. So at room temperature around 293 Kelvin, pentane would still be a liquid. Whereas the 2-methylbutane boiling point of 301 Kelvin is still also gonna be a liquid, but it's gonna boil a little bit more easily. There will be more of its vapor in the air. And the last one, the 2,2-dimethylpropane or isopentane has a boiling point of 282 Kelvin, which is lower than room temperature. And so that would be a gas at room temperature. For us to have a liquid of that, we'd have to bring the temperature down below 282 Kelvin, maybe like say 273 Kelvin, which would be about the freezing point of water to be able to turn this into a liquid. And so this is really just the branching or the surface area idea but it comes back to the polarizability. And so not only is the size important the, in terms of the number of atoms in the molecule, the number of electrons, those aren't the only things, it's also the shape of the molecule itself. So the more spread out it is, the more linear it is, the stronger the dispersion forces, the more branched it is, the weaker the dispersion forces. Now with some molecules, with some liquids, that's a little too hard to get to the boiling point. And so one of the other things we can look at besides boiling point is we can look at viscosity. And viscosity is gonna be a measure of the resistance to flow of a liquid. And of course, this is influenced by the shape, the molar mass, and the actual temperature. And so we can look at this data chart here for viscosity, and we can see the viscosity of all of these alkanes, hexane, octane, decane, dodecane, and hexadecane, so this is six, eight, 10, 12, and 16 carbons. And this measurement, measured unit that we've got here for the viscosity, notice is increasing as the molecules get larger. And this viscosity is increasing because these molecules are more strongly attracted to each other. For the final slide on nonpolar molecules, go ahead and take a look at these in two sets and think about what the boiling points would be and why. You can go ahead and pause the video. Last chance to pause. Okay, so for CH4, CF4, and CCL4, you should have thought about this as being a 
tetrahedral shape. Oops, I'm trying to erase that last line. There we go. And if you thought about this as a tetrahedral shape, then the CH4, the hydrogens are on all of the sides, the CF4, the fluorines are on all of the sides, the CCL4, they're all on the same sides. So these all have the same shapes. The difference, of course, is how many electrons are there around the hydrogens? Hopefully you said two. And how many electrons are there around the CF4 and the CCL4, and the fluorine and the chlorine? You should have said eight, since they follow the octet rule when they're on the outside of the molecule or the structure. But remember that there aren't just those valence electrons there. The valence shell for the chlorine is the third shell, whereas the valence shell for the fluorine is the second shell. So overall, CCL4 has the most electrons. And the more electrons something has, the stronger the dispersion points should be, dispersion forces. So the higher the boiling point should be. So out of these three, carbon tetrachloride should have the highest boiling point and methane, CH4, should have the lowest boiling point. Recall also, and again, it's a little harder to separate out this effect, but recall that as you go down the periodic table, the sizes of the atoms increase, and so the chlorine is much larger than the fluorine is, and the fluorine is also larger than the hydrogen. And so not only are these having more electrons, but they're also getting larger. If you look these molecules up, methane, carbon tetrafluoride and carbon tetrachloride, you should be able to find boiling points for them. And when you find the boiling points for these, the boiling point for methane is 112 Kelvin. The boiling point for carbon tetrafluoride is 145 Kelvin. And the boiling point for carbon tetrachloride is 350 Kelvin. So the methane and the carbon tetrafluoride would be gases at room temperature, and the carbon tetrachloride would be a liquid at room temperature. Any guesses what the boiling point would be for CBr4? As long as you said something greater than 350 Kelvin, you are correct. The actual boiling point of this would be 463 Kelvin. How about the bottom three molecules, this carbon tetraiodide, silicon tetraiodide, and germanium tetraiodide? What's going on with these? Hopefully you said that the central atom is getting larger. And because the central atom is getting larger, we're gonna have stronger disper dispersion forces as we compare these molecules to each other. Not only is the central atom getting larger, but because we're going down the periodic table for these, it's gonna have more electrons, and more electrons is gonna equal stronger dispersion forces. Now the one weird thing going on here is that when we go from the CBr4 to the Ci4, these iodines take up a little bit too much space. They're so big, they're actually touching each other. They're so big and they're touching each other and they're packed in so tight that this actually makes this molecule a little bit less stable. It's not as low in energy as it could be compared to something like CBr4. And so weirdly enough, the boiling point here goes down a little bit. The boiling point for the carbon tetraiodide is 408 Kelvin which we would not predict from the trend above. It's still pretty high, but it's a little bit lower than the CBr4. And again, the reason why is because the iodines are so big. They're just too close to each other. They're repelling each other a little bit too much. And this molecule is uh, not as stable as it could be. In fact, this molecule reacts very um, vigorously with water. So what do you think would happen if we go to a larger central atom? we would spread the iodines out more. If the iodines are spread out more and they're no longer as unstable, 
then the boiling point actually goes up because now we've got a larger central atom, we've got more electrons, and it happens to be more stable. And it, the boiling point for the silicon tetraiodide is 561 Kelvin. And I don't have a picture for the germanium tetraiodide, but its boiling point is 713 Kelvin. All right, that's it for the nonpolar molecules. The next video will be on uh, will be on polar molecules and hydrogen bonds. Thank you for watching this. Please join us in the chat.